and we have good morning everybody um today is the bi-weekly meeting of the umbc cyber defense lab uh, i'm alan sherman professor of computer science and director of the lab today it's our honor to have mario uh that sets a speak about his new work on um, a new type of CAPTCHA. Um, Mario, as you may know, a few years ago, spent a year um, at UMBC in the Cyber Defense Lab, finishing up his, his master's degree. And we've collaborated on a number of projects, especially voting and, and the Vodex voting system in particular. Um, in two weeks, um, uh, Cyrus Bonyadi, a PhD student here, will speak about his dissertation work. So thanks a lot for coming, Mario. Oh, you're, thank you for the invite. Let me just share my screen and please confirm if you can see the window. Give me a second. I'll just share the whole screen so you can probably see me and then Hopefully you can see this. Are we all set? You can see the whole screen. All right, amazing. So today we're going to talk about Gotcha, and this is it's a fun project that has a little fun story. And what we're trying to do with Gotcha is captures for the AI era. So just a quick intro uh, about myself. So I'm originally from Portugal. I studied at the University of Porto. I got a scholarship to do my master's thesis at UMBC. I was under Professor Alan Sherman, who kindly invited me to this talk. I've published with uh, Bank for International Settlements with, uh, I used to work uh, directly for David Chaum. So that was actually my first job straight out of college. I have a paper with Professor Sherman and some authors from the NSA. And I was cited by, uh, funny enough, by Vitalik, uh, the creator of Ethereum. So let's let's dive deep into captchas and where they started, right? So captchas date back to 2003 to this paper, where the these authors introduced this notion of using hard AI problems for securing the internet. So this starts in 2003, and this is straight out of their abstract, uh, and they very clearly say we introduced captcha. It's an automated test that humans can pass, but right now the current state of computing and and arguably machine learning and AI cannot pass. And they have a little caveat here that I really like. We hope that the use of AI, of our AI problems for security allows us to advance the field of artificial intelligence. So if you look back at 2003, when this was written, it made a lot of sense, right? The captures, I will, I will show a nice timeline, but captures back in the day were these like very hard, like letters people were like digitizing uh, some some documentation from the new york times and that was very hard uh, for ai to solve back then fast forward to today uh 21 years later when we now have uh, chat gpt out in the wild uh and that completely subverts the origin of captures so this is where i want to bring everyone's attention so this is the current state of captures. so if you go online it's highly likely whenever you're trying to register for a service or something that requires uh, where the web provider is trying to secure some accesses, they will show, show you something along these lines. So traditionally, uh, left and right captures are from H captcha. The center one is from Arcos. So Arcos right now secures most of the OpenAI and ChatGPT uh, services. So apparently a couple of weeks ago i was i was pretty much flagged as a bot and i had to solve a lot of these and these are pretty hard so if you look at this challenge this is a super confusing one and if you see here hopefully you can see my mouse but you see use the arrows to find the distance between the two cards and that's image one of eight so then you have to solve this eight times and this is a whole it's a whole challenge to solve this all of this to bring me to this point clearly there needs to be a need for innovation Right, like this is the state of captchas, and this should not be what secures the internet today. Right on the left, I don't think it's reasonable to ask that challenge to people. Like, find the image where a rat can like solve the maze and actually touch on the cheese pieces, or even this AI generated images from H captcha in the center, where you're supposed to click on AI generated steaks, and suddenly you have a little hybrid of a pizza and a sandwich here. <laughs> There's like very hybrid. 
if you actually see the full image, these look like salmon pieces and it's actually supposed to be a steak. And then you have the very ambiguous Google reCAPTCHA that you've probably come across where you're not really sure if that top square here with a circle, if that actually counts as part of the traffic lights or not. And we have, we actually reached a very interesting conclusion internally. So I believe we have uh, one of the authors working on this right now, Francisco in the call, but we are doing a, an extensive analysis at Gotcha to see what's the current state of CAPTCHAs when it comes to breaking of uh, ChatGPT when it comes to breaking CAPTCHAs. And we have some very interesting results. We, we're planning on publishing this pretty soon, but here, and I'll just spoil something here. Most of this actually comes down to the prompt you use uh, when you ask ChatGPT. Most of the times ChatGPT knows that it's solving a CAPTCHA and it's going to tell you, oh, sorry, I cannot help you with that task because what you're trying to do is something evil. You're, you're trying to bypass a CAPTCHA system. So we're actually trying, we're doing some, it's not really prompt engineering, although we're doing a bit of work in the actual prompt. So what we're trying to do is we pass just specific images, and then we completely ignore the fact that it's a CAPTCHA. So for example, here, I just post the image there and I say, is this image the right solution for the challenge? Uh, it's a yes or no question. Please explain to me why, right? But you could just simplify that prompt and just say, please say yes or no. And then you can send those screenshots of those frames and ChatGPT is actually able to break uh, our codes, arguably the most secure CAPTCHA right now. And so much so that it's actually deployed in the actual open AI platform, which I find a bit ironic. And all of this to say what? So captures are, are supposed to secure the internet against AI, but AI can already break all of the existing captures. So what exactly is the value proposition right now for these very hard challenges that people struggle to solve? So if you, I'm a lot on Twitter, but if, if you actually look up captures on Twitter, you're going to find a lot of people complaining to Airbnb, to Steam. So some of the platforms I use these exact CAPTCHAs where they go, listen, I'm trying to book a room right now and I can't because of this nonsense CAPTCHA. I, I, I guess I'm gonna have to book somewhere else. No one really wants to be in this situation, right? Where is it? There's a lot of friction to solve a CAPTCHA. AIs can break those CAPTCHAs. So it, it, it's, a, it, it's not a win-win for anyone. It's, it's a loss-loss. So here's what we're trying to do. Uh, gotcha actually stands for games orchestrated to tell computers and humans apart. So games are traditionally, uh, or can be traditionally easy to solve, right? You can have these days, you see this globally. So if you give a little simple game to a six year old kid, highly likely the kid is going to grab the phone and he's going to be able to play the actual game to so perform like a very short, uh, action there. So that's our goal with Gotcha. So what we're trying to do is we're going to try to break fun games instead of boring challenges. So short games and the goal, like kind of like the, the, the key performance indicator, something that would, we would have successfully completed our mission is if it's so much fun that users even want to solve it again. So imagine you're trying to register for a website, you put your email, your password, you click register, a captcha appears, you solve a little fun game. And now you're supposed to actually like create your account, but you go like, oh no, I don't even want to create an account. I would rather play that game again. That would be the epitome, like the, the pedigree of what we're trying to do. So now I just want to talk very quickly, kind of like roughly speaking, how captures work today, right? So if you go on a website and you're trying to perform an action, exactly how captures work. So you are a user, you access a website. That website is going to check. Uh, some info on that access, right? So you're going to set, send an HTTP request. You want to perform something. And this changes a lot from capture provider to capture provider. Uh, there is a big <laughs> kind of like theory that basically what reCAPTCHA does is they check for blacklisted IPs. So if you're accessing from a VPN, you will see these much more often. You will probably get the CAPTCHA in every single action you're trying to do. That's because a lot of people are like using that IP to perform different actions. And most importantly, they actually look at your search history and your cookies and your session in your browser, which I find a bit creepy, but that's what Google does. So it's actually pretty funny. If you just go on the same computer, you just open a, a private window and you actually try to perform the same action. It's highly likely that you'll get hit with a captcha. 
And that's because that fresh window doesn't have any cookies, doesn't have any search history. It's kind of like a fresh, it's a clean slate that you're trying to use to access the internet. Versus the other one, it's where you do all of your lookups, it's where you have your email, your Gmail, where you talk with people. It's kind of like you have your whole like life there. And I find it's a bit unfair that people like these service providers, they actually look at all this info and they just say, oh, sorry, we're just trying to check if you're a bot or not. But by the way, we got all of your info in that process. And even privacy preserving ones that they claim that they're privacy preserving, when you read their terms, they actually go over so much info that is in your computer and they basically claim like, oh no, but we're not gonna record this, so you're fine. So this is what happens at the moment you touch the website. So the website is gonna act like it's gonna look at that request. And then if you look like a bot, it's, you're gonna receive a captcha. You as a user serve the captcha the website is basically integrating the service provider API. So like all of these uh, websites, they like it's, it's just a couple of lines of, co of code to do this bot detection. You serve the user with a captcha. If it looks like a bot, the user gives you back a little solution to that puzzle. So more traditionally, you click on the little squares and you send kind of like the indexes of, of, of where in the, the matrix you click. That goes to the service provider service provider gives you green light and if so the user can then access uh, the resources so this is extremely centralized it's pretty straightforward that's the whole flow so one thing i want to cover is the evolution of ai and captchas right so if we date back to when captcha started 2000 2003 it was these text recognitions right so you as a user you were faced a captcha you had to type the actual word and then you would be green lighted or not. So a lot of people were actually helping digitize text. Then people started training AI models to actually be able to be very good at recognizing that text. So that became inefficient. So if you fast forward to 2012, that's where the big, like the first revolution of CAPTCHA started. So from here onwards, it was always a variation of an image recognition task. It was either a click on the car, where is the cylinder in this image? Uh, what, what triangle is farther away from the X axis, like from what X axis, something along, it was always something along those lines. It was always image recognition. You also have depth percent perception. It was like, which is the object that is like furthest away from like the, the where the image is placed. And you would click like, oh, it's the cylinder. So what we've tested is basically that ChatGPT4 can completely subvert most of those. And one little trick we use, and I hopefully that I hope this doesn't really get back to me, is when we receive a matrix of like like the challenges that you you have to click like oh click on the owl or the stake. So what we do, the easiest way to get a solution to that from uh, ChatGPT is you break that into the actual nine images, and it, you just ask, is there a stake in this image? And you just send a little mini square. ChatGPT has no idea that that's a CAPTCHA because you're basically just sending an image and it goes like, no, there's not a stake there. You do that nine times and you get exactly which indices have the proper solution. So that, that is completely broken. So there has to be something new. And that's what we're trying to do. One fun thing that we're trying to explore as well is this notion of having emotional intelligence challenges. And this is kind of like out in the open. We don't, we're not fully sure what the future entails. There is a very uh, popular expression that says the best way to predict the future is to like create it yourself. So that's what we're trying to do. But I'm sure a lot of stuff is going to happen now in the next couple of years because these challenges have been broken com completely. So I want to dive deep now exactly how does gotcha work? So this is the architecture of our system. So we have a user on the left side, classic access as a website, classic. That website has to register to use Gotcha. So the exact same thing that a website does to register to use reCAPTCHA, HCAPTCHA, or any, any CAPTCHA provider, it's the exact same flow, exact same API integration. Nothing really changes other than the actual links. Right? So instead of having reCAPTCHA.js, uh, reCAPTCHA API.js, you would have Gotcha API.js. So nothing really changes structure wise. So it would be very easy for any website using any of those CAPTCHA providers to roll over to ours. And then we do something quite interesting here. So then we have this load balancer. 
we call it load balancer just because it's like the easiest uh, term to understand in the, the CS uh, terms or literature. This load balancer is basically randomly going to select one worker. We call them workers. So we have a worker pool. You have these workers that actually produce captchas. So imagine the worker on the top left produces a little fun game like Candy Crush. The little uh, worker on the top right has a game that you or you have to perform some type of dragging motion. So you imagine you have to drag like a roller coaster and make it force it to do like a specific path. And then the bottom right can be another another type of challenge. So these guys register in a smart contract and they, the smart contract acts as a public key infrastructure. So they basically have a public key, they register in a smart contract and they say, if you want to reach out to me, I'm, I'm happy to help. So just a checkpoint here, many of you guys may probably be asking, why is this decentralized? So this is decentralized because we want the solution to be extensible for anyone in the, the internet ecosystem. If you prefer to have a centralized ecosystem, this exact system works, but instead of having a worker pool, you have one worker. Oh. And you can even make custom deployments. This is something I find very interesting. So instead of actually integrating with Recatch, you can very well pay for a custom deployment. So like UMBC, if they want to secure their own uh, infrastructure, their own websites, they don't even need to rely on Recatch itself or, or Gotcha itself. They can run their own infrastructure locally. So technically speaking, I'm going to go over the whole flow. Uh, I wanted to do a ladder diagram, but it was, it was too many entities and it was, it was going to get too overcrowded. But here you have step one on the bottom, right? You have a worker. The worker registers on the smart contract. So they generate a public key pair, they generate a smart contract, and they're basically saying, I am ready to serve captures. Website is going to register on Gotcha. So the website goes, I am website ABC. I would like to secure my infrastructure with your captures. And they register with Gotcha. So they get an API key. Obviously, there is an integration of that API in the actual website. A user then eventually accesses this website and they request a new CAPTCHA. This goes to the load balancer. And the reason why it's going to the load balancer is if we decentralize, you kind of want to make sure that malicious people don't always select their malicious friends. And that way you, you would not have a clean distribution of, of CAPTCHA selection. So there is actually a VRF in this process. So the load balancer receives a request runs a VRF locally and sees, okay, out of this pool, it does a shuffle in the, in the list. This, the shuffle is very, very quick. Uh, it's, it's, it's negligible in this process. It does the shuffle and says, okay, this message is supposed to go to number three. It touches on worker number three, worker number three goes double checks that it's actually for them. And it goes like, okay, this makes sense. Responds, sends to the website. The website can also do this lookup uh, very quickly. That website requests the CAPTCHA, the load balancer randomly chooses the worker, right? And then requests the CAPTCHA from the worker. Worker checks the selection, responds with CAPTCHA, and load balancer sends the CAPTCHA to the website. And then here you have the same flow, the user just solves the CAPTCHA and that's, that's done. Now with this in mind, we have this worker pool, we want to make fun CAPTCHAs. So there's a couple of different potential CAPTCHA approaches that we have. The first approach is to have an interactive story. So this is even used a lot. I was actually watching an episode of Dr. House and it was pretty funny because this appeared independently. So you can ask a person with a series of, of images to try to make an actual like an empathy story from, from that. So you would have a narrative that you have to, to fulfill and then you have a list of images. So this is something worth exploring. It's somewhat time consuming for the users it's not really fully tested against AI, but it's definitely something interesting to keep in mind. Uh, I literally just have a PDF open on, on a couple of new classes of art problems for AIs that apparently are not really like, they're super easy for humans and it's like some unexpected stuff. Then we can do visual puzzles, right? So kind of similar to, to what exists today. But the main thing with today is, today the challenge is static. Right? You get shown an image and you have to solve, you have to just click on whatever image it is. So our goal is to make it, to turn this challenge into two things. So instead of just clicking 
on like doing a clean like image recognition what you're going to do is you send the game to the the website and the website has to do two things the ai the bot has to do two things first it has to recognize what type of challenge it's received because we're always changing that type of challenge and then it has to solve right so you can already see kind of like that the problem it folds into two parts so first you have to recognize the challenge that you're facing which is an interactive challenge, by the way. So it's not like you can just ping a ChatGPT API and that API is going to solve it for you. You actually have to do a little flow uh, with you as a user. And you probably experienced this. So if you go on G-Test, you just slide a little puzzle piece into a little square. So that kind of makes sense because it's an interactive challenge. You cannot feed it to ChatGPT. But you can beat that algorithmically though. So there's actually, that was being destroyed. Uh, there's a couple of JavaScript algorithms where they just compare the shade as you drag down the puzzle piece and they go like, boom, this little square is exactly where it should be. So then we have uh, creativity based tasks. Uh, so this would allow a person to uh, create some, do some creating content, creative content. And again, kind of touching on that interactive story, you would have an empathy driven task. This is one of the most interesting ones. And this, this came to life because one time we were talking with an investor and it was, it was a very funny conversation because he said, captures have already been solved. Like anyone who's trying to bypass captures, they just pay a service in another country. And there is a person in that other country that solves the captcha for you. So you didn't even have to worry. So if you were doing analytics, that's what you do. You pay like one cent per captcha solving and you're golden. You don't even have to worry about anything. Like the bot can just leave freely. So then we start to think about something super interesting, which is, can you have a challenge that the person in a specific location can solve, but then the moment it touches the click farm, so these malicious solvers, they can and this states this kind of like goes back to a lot of like human fundamentals and i was thinking so i live in cayman islands right now so it's highly unlikely that someone in south america country an asian country that they will know the supermarkets here right or the electricity company or the water company but pretty much everyone here knows exactly what's the where they go for shopping was the name of the school they go to. So now you have kind of like this interesting vertical to tackle where you can literally have a caption where it's very easy for me. It's going to be very hard for the AI as well, because the AI has like has to deal with a lot of logos. It's some logos are going to be a bit obscure, especially when it comes to like electricity, water companies are going to be like, oh, I have no idea what's going on here. And they can't even be sent to the click farms because then it goes, goes to the click farm and then unless the click farm kind of has start looking up and go like oh my god what's the like what are the existing supermarkets in cayman and they, they start going on google and that takes time right so that no longer that is no longer one cent per caption now they have to do a whole process to then try to pass the caption and then send back the cookie and by the time that that happens the session already probably expired Right, so this is one of the most promising ones. And right now the, the main problem with this approach is tourists. So if you have a tourist in a country, it's highly unlikely that the tourist that is there for a week knows exactly the name of the electricity companies or water companies. So th this, it's very much an open problem, but it's very promising. So our intuition here is that maybe depending on the website that the that a user is accessing specific captures are served based on, on that right so imagine if you're actually going on a, a supermarket website and you're trying to do something there it's probably very reasonable to assume that you're very familiar with with some of the things that are happening in that country so then you can kind of thread carefully and, and act accordingly so Roughly speaking, the security of gotcha, and this, there's a couple of things here, and I, I know that there's a lot of cryptography background here. So this is by any means a formal analysis of, of what the security is, but the security of gotcha has, there, there's a couple of verticals there. So number one, you would have the protocol, right? We have a whole protocol. We need to make sure that the protocol itself is secure. 
and and we've we've been talking with uh, people at UMBC to, to help us out with this. Then you have the actual challenge, right? So you go through the whole protocol, like the capture, you, you are served the capture. Can an AI beat that capture? So we argue that right now we are more secure than any other capture system exactly because we provide, we break this down into two tasks. So number one, you have to recognize the challenge. And if it's a game, it's particularly hard. And one of the things we're exploring is to have gener generative AI to generate like specific game concepts and then iterate on those games very quickly. And then you can kind of rotate games very quickly as well. So you're kind of like racing against, like it, it would be a lot of waste because people would have to train uh, machine learning models on new games and then the game would be deleted and you, you would be, you'd be spending a lot of resources compared to existing captures today. Existing captures today are very, very static. Nothing really changes. So you have to recognize the challenge and then solve the challenge. And keep in mind, if this is a game interaction, this is hard, right? Because you need to train the AI model with that game. And then you need to become like, you need to kind of like mimic how a human would solve that game. So you're, you're playing with fire there. And these games cannot be solved via an API. So you already mitigate probably the biggest attack vector that exists right now, which is a user just taking a screenshot of that capture that they were served sending it to the GPT API and the GPT API responds right away with the solution. And we just highlight here that the game should be short lived in an ideal world. They would be ephemeral. Obviously this is going to take time until we get here, but that would be the pedigree where you have games that are super fun and they just, they're very short lived. So we have a custom AI that learn, knows how to like, create games, uh, very quickly. And then the game would be short lived. And like, boom, then it would disappear. So then to actually beat this, you, you would need to spend many resources to actually train a proper AI to, to know how to recognize all of these games are always changing and then solving them. So we're, we're still a bit away from that. Then for future work, what we have here, and there's a couple of fun ideas that we float around. So the first thing is blind signatures for the registration. And this, it turns out that there isn't really a big need for this in the market, but I also feel like people don't know that they may need this because right now, a lot of big providers, so HBO, Adobe, a lot of big, big players, they use captchas somewhere in their services. And if that captcha service dies, if for whatever reason, some legislation is approved and that capture provider can no longer support that website, then that website is going to suffer some like critical outage because a massive flow in their website is about to go down. So users will no longer be able to register, for example. And if you have an enterprise plan, it's going to be a fairly like tricky switch because you, you're talking about calling your IT admin, then that, that goes down. You have to figure out why it's down. Then you have to like change uh, billing into another provider. So it, it's a whole mission. And regardless, they will always recognize like a capture provider always knows like, oh, HBO is sending me a capture. And th there's a lot of like bad things that can be done with that information. So one of the things we were exploring and we kind of have that designed is this notion of having a blind signature in the registration process. So that way, when you make a request, we just know that it's someone who registered making a request. Now checkpoint here, obviously, if you can do traffic analysis, you can look at volume, right? So if you have one key, you have Nike and a, a smaller website registered in the platform, and one key is making a million requests per week, and the other one is only making 10,000, you can kind of infer stuff there. Right. But if it's pretty even, or if you have a couple of like more big players and a couple of like smaller players, you're going through a lot of work now to try to understand who is actually querying for new captures. Another very interesting thing that appeared is this notion of using zero knowledge proofs. And the, the, this term right now is extremely popular in the, in the, both AI and, and cryptography and cr cryptocurrency included, but can we have these new games such that we prove that they have a correct solution, right? And for example, Sudoku. And then you can prove very quickly that the game is correct. So if you actually solve the solution, you can generate a proof that says, listen, I solved this 
this is done. So you don't even need to touch that backend, that capture provider, the whatever website, like the website provider itself can be like, oh, you're right, great, you solved it. So this is something very promising and it's, it's easier said than done, right? So even with, I was doing a, some work with this uh, on having verifiable game execution. So for example, if you have a specific game, what if you get the random seed and then that game instance has a specific game execution and then you can kind of prove that you, you were able to do that properly. Or so you can say like, oh, I don't know if you're playing Call of Duty, you can be like, oh, on second three, this just appeared on this like right corner and you would run that, that would be a verifiable game execution. So you'd be like, oh yeah, that's correct. That's actually what happens on second three for your instance. So this is very promising, but it's very computationally intense, very computational intensive. So right now, uh, a lot of the, especially ZK Snarks work, uh, brings a lot of computational power to the prover. And the prover may be on a mobile phone, right? So you don't really want the user to then click on submit captcha, have to wait for a couple of seconds for the proof generation to take place to then just save like 10 milliseconds on the, on the website that goes, oh, okay, that, that captcha is correct. So this is very promising, cryptographically speaking, real world speaking, the usability right now, it's not there. And, but it's definitely worth exploring because there may be some categories of games where this makes sense. Then probably my favorite uh, vertical of this future work is the ephemeral game creation, right? So if you have this way of creating games that are short-lived, that would be extremely powerful. That requires a substantial amount of work. One of the things we have is we've also worked to get people in the team that are familiar with games and stories. So recently we, we have one of the lead animators of, of Crash Bandicoot, it was a very, very popular game in the PlayStation saga, join our team. And he was very excited, very, very excited. And he actually pointed out something very interesting, which was that there is a whole game category literally created to be fun and accessible. And I was like, that's a match made in heaven because that's literally what we're trying to do. And he was like, yeah, that's what we were trying to do with Crash Bandicoot. It was a very simple game where the little kind of like raccoon you move it around and can do certain actions and anyone, pretty much anyone can play it. So this is very promising. Obviously it requires a lot of time investment because then you have to kind of like train models to generate this properly. Then the games also have to be lightweight, right? So it's not like we can dump a binary into a website, then you have to run like a whole massive game. So th there's a lot of trade-offs there. Right now what we're trying to do is we're trying to keep this pretty simple to make the, the challenges, first of all, interactive and very different and fun, right? So that's what we're trying to do. And then evolve, iterate carefully on those, those actual games. Mitigating click farms is very, very promising. Uh, there's a couple of caveats there, but this is touching again on, on what was mentioned is basically this notion of having what we think, right? Like the easiest way to solve this is culturally uh, relevant captures. But another way of going about this is, and this we've, we've been discussing with the protocol analysis lab, is to have this notion of binding in the CAPTCHA challenge. So a CAPTCHA is served to a specific user. Ideally, that's interactive, that's short-lived. So the, the person trying to like be malicious and send this to a bot should not really have even time or, or like cryptography capabilities to send to somewhere else to then re resolve, to then send to me and then, and then go, go back and, and prove that it was correctly. Unless maybe they reveal their secret key, right? So if I can almost do like a selective disclosure to a specific key, then that key is like binded to this iter like iteration or this instance. So that's something that we were exploring. Uh, obviously in the startup life that there's a lot of things we want to do, but there's kind of like more, more important things on, on the lower level of the actual execution of, of the project and then accessibility, right? So we always want to focus on everyone. So we want to make sure that the challenges we serve and the stuff that we show to the users are accessible. So we need to make sure that if you're colorblind, that you can solve the game. If you're blind, that you have some type of other challenge. Now, this is very tricky. This is something I discussed with the, the Crash Bandicoot guy. 
because you lose one major sense, right? So it's very hard to then with the sounds kind of like making this notion of, of a game. So this is something worth exploring, but, but it's, it's fundamentally hard. And I'll point out that a couple of years ago, I think it was at DEF CON, there was a big paper <laughs> that exploited reCAPTCHA. And what they did was you, have, uh, you would go to a website, the capture would show you, the website would show you a CAPTCHA. You would, click on, you would click on, you would pretend that you cannot see, you would click on the little audio challenge. The audio challenge would render some type of audio. So what they did was get this audio, send it to Google's recognition, then Google's recognition would tell you exactly what, what was in that audio, and then you would just bypass the caption. So Google itself was killing its own service. And that, that was a pretty interesting attack. And this is this ends up being a big limitation, right? You don't want this to be your Achilles heel, but you don't also you, you cannot make this super hard so that people that have have problems cannot really access the resources. So there's a, a lot of trade-offs and a lot of tricky caveats here. With this in mind, we have already been supported by a couple of blockchain foundations. So uh, the Algorand Foundation uh, was our first grant. Then there was the Internet Computer Foundation. They supported us. Uh, they've been probably our most avid supporters. We got a grant from the XX Network, so that is the blockchain created by David Chan. And very recently, I think it was like two weeks ago, we got a grant from the WorldCoin Foundation. And there's a lot of synergy there because what WorldCoin is trying to do is to focus on this notion of a proof of personhood. And we end up touching on that vertical as well, right? Because we're doing captures, so we're trying to prove that you're not a bot. And by proving that you're not a bot, you're effectively proving that you are a human, right? So there's a lot of, a lot of potential for collaboration there. And a lot of the work we're doing, we're doing with them, it has to do exactly with how secure are captures really? Like, how can we change captures? Uh, what is, what does the future entail for this, for this actual problem we have in the world, right? Now that is the end of my talk. I just want to point out that we are open for collaborations. If you have ideas, if you have questions, uh, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we are very open. So we come from an academic background. We like to bring stuff into the real world. So we end up having kind of like the best of both worlds. So we go down the formal route. We like to study things and do it properly. So we, you would be looking at the proper protocol with proper proofs and like the whole thing. But you would also have like the whole implementation thing and work with uh, the Crash Bandicoot guy. We have a storyboard artist that was involved with uh, Rick and Morty. So there's there's a lot of interesting and very fun things that you can do uh, with us. So I think I'll stop for questions and happy to answer anything. Ryan has a question in the chat. Oh, sorry, I didn't see the chat. Okay. Uh, but, 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 can the workers and gotchas? Go yeah, so the goal is that, but we do have, uh, you have to be careful with that, right? Because if you make it very easy to register, then anyone can register and they can also flood your system. So it's the whole anti civil problem or, or civil problem. And so one of the things we're doing is we have this commit reveal notion where you kind of are vetted the games you're showing that they are vetted and then you can prove it like you are actually only serving proper uh, challenges. But the goal would be for anyone. So if you have a laptop at home, you can just spin that up temporarily or permanently you choose and you would be able to join the system. Yeah. And ideally, if you think in like a blockchain context. Uh, you would have imagine polygon polygon has a lot of nodes so some of those nodes could be like oh we want our nodes to secure the polygon ecosystem so then those nodes could be running the captcha service so i'm curious about uh this idea you had uh, about using like human empathy as a <coughs> sorry i'm uh, my my throat's uh, a little bit stuck, but I was curious about this idea about using empathy as a way to like distinguish uh, computers uh, from humans in captchas. Like, how how would you imagine that would like work out? Like, well, like how could you uh, operationalize the concept of empathy? 
Yeah, that, that is, a, it's a very interesting open problem and it's something very interesting expo exploring. I actually have the other co-founder here in the call and he's like the big AI guy. And this is a concept that he mentioned. So I don't know if he wants to take, oh, there he is, he's, he has the camera on now. So maybe he's the right guy to take this, this question. So it's, it, you actually get the best of both worlds. You have both people here. Hi there. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Um, yes. I'm Dwight. That, that's a, that's actually a great question. Um, so as Mario was explaining, um, there's a difference between understanding and mimicking human behavior. And this, I mean, I, I apologize if we go into very, um, you know, uh, subject, they're not subjective, but kind of like not as deterministic concepts as, as we would wish. Uh, but unfortunately that's, that's what we have in, in AI, uh, today. There's a difference between understanding and mimicking. I mean, most of you guys probably have already um, used uh, GPT-4 and ChatGPT, and you know basically when uh, the LLMs, state-of-the-art uh, GPTs, uh, they go into this uh, kind of like loop of going back and forth, and and you 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 generate frustration because they don't understand what they're what they're doing, and they're just mimicking the language of saying, "Oh, I'm sorry," they don't really. Um, so AI as of today doesn't really have the capability of understanding um, empathy and has, uh, let's say, has learned, um, uh, you know, pre-programmed and deterministic routes when it comes to uh, moral dilemmas, uh, constraints imposed by, you know, the, the, the developers of these systems uh, because they don't want necessarily, you know, an AI to be responsible um, for you know, making an, an, an ethical decision that may have repercussions. So circling back to your question, how would we include this? So for instance, um, imagine a scenario in which we have basically um, um, something like you're, you're in a, imagine you're in a market and you have a mini game and the mini game says, um, uh, imagine that uh, somebody dropped a diamond necklace. Um, so what do you do? Three options. Option A, you find his keepers. Option B, you give it to the lost and found. Option three, something. Then you click on one of the options. It, there's no really, there's not not really uh, like a, a, a wrong answer at this point. Uh, but then after that, you present uh, the user with a moral dilemma. Like then there's a little girl that says that the necklace is hers, and then there's an old lady that says that that's you know her, that that it's hers. You know, and this this will be a moral dilemma that an LLM uh, or in this case GPT wouldn't actually be able to uh, go uh, to basically choose, um, or if it does choose, it will choose most often times the exact same thing. So statistically speaking, people would you know go like different routes, and LLMs will follow a specific, um, more logical path that they have learned because we humans have tried to program LLMs to be as ethically as ethical as possible. And we've realized that, you know, humans are more, let's say, evenly distributed, um, so to say. Also, something worth, worth mentioning is that, uh, I mean, you, most of you guys are familiar with the concept of like honeypotting. And um, like in the past, historically, that has been, you know, kind of like be included uh, in the websites themselves, like for instance, hidden like hidden fields that you know scrapers would detect as a as a field in the form, they would fill that. Uh, but now you can basically take that concept inside, um, um, yeah, kind of the these little challenges. So historically, in the past, it was people were less capable at these tasks than AI. Now AI is so much more capable that we kind of are not necessarily, um, maybe the, the challenges won't be to, uh, for, for humans to solve, but we'll try to honeypot an AI and check, oh, this challenge was solved impossibly quickly, right? So this is definitely an AI. Or the, like 100% of the entities accessing this this resource went down this very logical path that we kind of, um, you know, have identified that AIs would go through. And basically that's, um, that's a little bit um, how you could go about this. I hope I um, shed a little bit of light and, and I answered your question. Uh, yes, it answered my question. Thank you.
Thank you. I see we have another question great... in the chat. Oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry. I was just going to say, it's a great question. And, and, you know, we're more than happy to get all, like basically all of your thoughts because this is definitely not a solved problem yet. Yeah, so that's literally, it's something very important to highlight, right? So we kind of reached this point now where AI evolves so quickly, where we're kind of trying to figure out, all right, where do we draw the line on? What can a human do? So right now on the internet, it's very hard, especially like presently today, it's very hard to distinguish uh, an AI interaction with a human interaction, which is, it's almost like what, what Turing mentioned back in the day with this notion of like distinguishing the, the, the interaction you're having. And these are verticals that we have that we pointed out that so far kind of remain very interesting and unsolved as compared to just image recognition. So it's, it's, it's very nice. It's very nice to explore these things. And it, it, sometimes it's always very hard to kind of exactly find what the trade-offs are. And, and and then exactly know what an AI would do, etc. I see that you have and a question here from Ram. I have seen a few captures where a video is played and a user needs to identify some names displayed or identify spoken numbers in the video. Are these solved by AI? So I've never seen these captures. If you actually have these examples, please please send it to me because we have a big uh, library of, of captures that we found and I've never seen these. So regarding the video, I like, as far as I know right now, no, but the number, yes. So the number would be the exact thing solving that the DEF CON guys did when they broke recapture, right? So you would, the video doesn't really matter because if it, it's a spoken number and maybe the video shows one thing and the number that it said is another thing, it's very traditional to try to, tip, to, to trick the entity solving, then you would just get that audio. So forget the actual frames send it to an audio recognition and the audio recognition would both in sub second give you exactly the number or sets of numbers and it, i mean i'm pretty sure that would be a fun thing to test right if you if the capture appears and then you just turn on turn on siri or alexa the, the does the actual uh, phone recognize because if so then then it's game over but it's legit. If you have if you have examples of this if there's a specific website that you know that serves these captures please uh, send it to us. So national parks, that's from Ryan, national parks run into this issue with trash cans. Uh, you can't bear proof a trash can because the smartest bear is smarter than the dumbest visitor. Yeah, fair, fair enough. Yeah, <laughs> that's a great, that's a great example there. Is there anything that could be done with cryptographic binding to the channel? Yes. So this is, this is something that we we've we the two of us have already discussed and and this is very related with the work that is being done at the protocol analysis lab so we actually executed this attack where imagine uh this you have umbc's website right umbc website the university website they have captures to register for a workshop okay that's fine it's a legit website valid for this talk if you wanted to register for this talk there was a capture there that's a legitimate website. You can create a fake website that gets that capture from UMBC. And this fake website or malicious website shows this capture to people and you're performing a different action here on the malicious website. The user solves that and that response gets sent to the UMBC capture. And then UMBC is actually being subverted. And ironically, because people are actually solving proper captures, but they're solving in a different execution, they're not really solving it on the UMBC's website. And this is the definition of a binding problem, right? There is an execution that is associated with UMBC. And in effect, the user is solving a CAPTCHA tied to UMBC, but they think it's tied with something else. This is very common on malicious websites that are uh, like plus 18, uh, like more less appropriate websites, uh, betting. So a lot of websites that are, are traditionally have a lot of volume. So you would be surprised by the volume these websites have. And behind the scenes, there is a little malicious script that is performing malicious actions in other websites. So you as a user, if you go on, if you go on a website, you don't even really know if the capture that you're being served comes from that website. There's no way to know it right now. And this is because of the way TLS works, right? You don't authenticate client side. So by default, the, you're already very constrained in the type of cryptography you can do right there natively. 
Uh, so that that's a big, big binding issue. We demonstrated that with with both capture providers, so Recapture and HCapture. That code isn't live yet, but we it, it's also in the paper that we're writing where we kind of see at the different uh, attacks that you can do. That's one of them. That's one of them. Oh, perfect. It's, it was work. I just saw a message from Ram. It was work done by a few students. Yes, please. Thank you so much. That, that would be amazing. Are there any more questions? questions? Duarte, I don't know if you're talking. I think Duarte was talking, but he was muted. You're still muted. Yes, yes, I was. Apologies. Um, I added our emails in the chat. Please do feel free to send any, you know, thoughts, uh, you know, by request for collaboration. We yes, if you want to help out, if you want to help out, if you want to be involved in the papers, anything, we're, we're very, very open. If you think you could write another paper on a different set of problems, we're very, very happy to collaborate. Well, thank you so much. It was a very interesting talk. Thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. So this concludes uh, today's session. We'll be back in two weeks. Yes, Ryan, absolutely. The context in the CAPTCHA could be, could be used to, to bind. One of the things I was thinking of, it, it was, it, it had to do with symbols. So you would have like a little symbol associated with a specific instance, but it's kind of hard to execute, but this is, so we're, we're exploring this notion of content in the game itself as well, because that's, that's a, a, it's an interesting path to monetization and that would, that, that would actually solve it. Right. If you're, if you're on the UFC, UMBC website and you have a local deployment of UMBC captures and the UMBC logo appears on the captcha on another website, you'd be, oof, I'm not, I'm not on the right place. So that's a definitely, definitely a very, very interesting approach. Like you're authenticating off chain on off uh, off uh, offline almost. <laughs>